Welcome to Tennessee's At Home Learning Series for Literacy. Today's lesson is for all our eighth grade students, although everyone is welcome to tune in. This lesson is the first in this week's series. My name is Mr. Ayers, and I am an eighth grade teacher in Tennessee Public Schools. I am so excited to be your teacher for this lesson. Welcome to my virtual classroom. If you didn't see our previous lessons, you can find them at www.tn.gov education. You can still tune in to today's lesson if you haven't seen our others. In this lesson set, we'll be studying some very well-regarded and widely studied poets. We will learn about English poets, William Blake, and A.E. Hausman's, as well as an American poet, Emily Dickinson. Poetry has been a powerful mode of writing in American and British history, and our goal is to gain a deeper understanding of some of the most successful poets and how they impacted their respective societies. We will begin today's lesson by learning about William Blake and his poetry. Before we get started, to participate fully in today's lesson, you're gonna need three things, paper, pencil, and a surface to write on. Today, our goal is to read an informational text, William Blake, 1757 to 1827. And in order to understand important details about Blake that will assist us in understanding his poetry, we will also take some time to learn a helpful tool for understanding poetry. I will guide you in learning how to use this tool and you will practice with one of Blake's poems, The Fly. We'll begin with me reading the short text as a whole and then we will reread it and pause along the way for a deeper understanding. At the end of the lesson, I will assign you independent work that you can complete after the video ends. Now, let's dig into the first text we will be studying, which is a brief introduction to Blake's life and work. The title of the informational text is William Blake, 1757 to 1827, which of course indicates his lifespan and that he lived to be approximately 70 years of age. The author is not listed for this text, so we will simply refer to him or her as the author. Okay? All right, let's read the text. William Blake, 1757 to 1827. From the time he was a child, William Blake had a distinct or unique way of looking at the world. As a young boy, he returned from a walk in the country to tell his parents that he had seen a tree filled with angels. And this type of creative expression or communication likely paved the way for his poetic future. Blake began writing poetry within a few years of that incident. His first printed work, Poetical Sketches, was published in 1783. In addition to being a poet, Blake was also a skilled painter and, and engraver. An engraver is someone who inscribes something onto an object. He frequently worked for London booksellers engraving illustrations for books and magazines. Through his work, he also made connections to other people who were making waves in the literary and political movements of the time. Living in England at the time of Britain's war was the American colonies. Blake often addressed political topics in his work. He took a stance or opinion against King George in his country's treatment of the colonists and sided with radicals like Thomas Paine. A radical is someone who supports complete reform. Much of Blake's work also addressed religious and spiritual themes. Even his works with some people view as simple and childlike, such as Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience, contained veiled or partially hidden criticisms of society. During his life, 
Blake did not become well known as a poet among the general population and was actually more highly regarded as an engraver. His work as a poet grew in popularity after his death. He continues to be well respected as a poet and an artist today. Now, let's dig into the first text a little deeper. Let's start with the first paragraph. Listen as I reread it to you. From the time he was a child, William Blake had a distinct or unique way of looking at the world. As a young boy, he returned from a walk in the country to tell his parents that he had seen a tree filled with angels. And this type of creative expression or communication likely paved the way for his poetic future. Blake began writing poetry within a few years of that incident. His first printed work, Poetical Sketches, was published in 1783. Notice that the author uses the word distinct to describe Blake's way of viewing the world. Based on the context, what is a word or phrase that would be similar in meaning to distinct? Take a moment to think and write your answer on your paper. Be sure to include a detail from the text that supports your answer. Did you write unique or different or specific or something else similar? That is indeed the meaning of distinct in this context. Let's take 30 seconds and practice using this word in a sentence. In one to two sentences, describe someone you know who is unique and creative. Be sure to use the word distinct and to include a precise detail of that person. All right? Write your sentence. Excellent. Thank you. Let's revisit a sentence that we read earlier. And this type of creative expression or communication likely paved the way for his poetic future. What does the author mean when he or she uses the word expression here? Using context clues from what we have read, write down a word or phrase that captures its meaning. Be sure to include a detail from the text that supports your answer. Great. If you said communication or assertion or statement, you are capturing the meaning used by this author. All right. Now let's take a look at the next two sentences. Blake began writing poetry within a few years of that incident. His first printed work, Poetical Sketches, was published in 1783. Now, we have already learned that Blake was distinctively creative and that his creativity led him to write poetry. Based on what you know about poetry, why do you think Blake was particularly drawn to this type of writing? Write your answer on your paper.
perfect. One of the unique aspects of poetry is that it is not literal. You are allowed plenty of latitude or freedom with the words you choose and how you use them. This is much different than someone who writes informational text where the purpose is to communicate something directly and precisely. With poetry, there are no rules. This type of writing would therefore be very attractive to someone uniquely creative like William Blake. Let's revisit paragraph two. Listen as I read the paragraph. In addition to being a poet, Blake was also a skilled painter and engraver. An engraver is someone who inscribes something onto an object. He frequently worked for London booksellers, engraving illustrations for books and magazines. Through his work, he also made connections to other people who were making waves in the literary and political movements of the time. Based on the context, what do you think the word engraver means here? If you thought someone who inscribes something onto an object, you're correct. Note that during this time, books and magazines would have, would have had illustrations much more complex in their creation than the prints we see today. All right, let's keep reading. Though his work, he, Blake, also made connections to other people who were making waves in the in the literary and political movements of the time. When you hear the phrase, made connections with other people who were making waves in the literary and political movements of the time, how might this be significant for Blake? Remember, we've learned some information about him so far. So try to think about what we already know and try to make that connection of how this might be significant for Blake, him making those literary and political movements, making those connections with people who were doing that. Take a moment and write your answer on your paper. You may have said that it might create opportunities for him to express his creativity in more professional settings, and that's absolutely correct. Making connections is an important step in finding opportunities in the professional world. Let's keep reading. Living in England at the time of Britain's war with the American colonies, Blake often addressed political topics in his work. He took a stance or opinion against King George and his country's treatment of the colonists and sided with radicals like Thomas Paine. A radical is someone who supports complete reform. Much of Blake's work also addressed religious and spiritual themes. Even his works that some people view as simple and childlike, such as Songs of Innocence and Songs of Experience, contained veiled or partially hidden criticisms of society. Based on the context, what do you think the term radicals means here? Write the answer on your paper and include evidence from the text. You may have said someone who is extreme in their beliefs, and that is certainly part of the meaning, but there is a nuance or a subtle difference in meaning that is not as easily noticeable. The term radicals in the political sense does not necessarily mean extreme as we often understand it. It can also have a simple meaning of someone who differs greatly from the established political or religious system. 
It would really, therefore, depend on your perspective. Both the radicals and the established groups just have different ideas, but neither would have to be necessarily extreme. Let's see how Blake's work fit into this by continuing reading. Some of you may be unfamiliar with the term veiled. When we look at that word, let's look at the root word veil. You might recall that a veil is a headpiece that can be worn to partially conceal someone's face. It has a very similar meaning here, considering this is an adjective that describes his criticism. What do you think the author means when he or she says, Blake's work contained veiled criticisms of society. Why do you think Blake would express criticism this, in this way? Take a minute to write down your thoughts on your paper. You may have written that veiled criticism might mean partly hidden or indirect criticism, and that Blake may have been careful not to draw attention to himself or his opinions for fear that those in power might take revenge on him. It could also be that this is his preferred mode of expression or communication since he writes poetry, which, as we mentioned earlier, is indirect by nature. Let's take a look at the last paragraph. During his life, Blake did not become well known as a poet among the general population and was actually more highly regarded as an engraver. His work as a poet grew in popularity after his death. He continues to be well respected as a poet and an artist today. It is often the case that someone becomes more famous after they have died. In Blake's case, as the text states, his poetry and his artistry are what he is remembered for the most. Now that we have a solid understanding of Blake's life and work, let's take a brief look at one of his poems. This poem by Blake is called The Fly. We're only going to do an initial read right now as we'll take a deeper look at it later. Let's read the poem. The Fly. Little fly, Thy summer's play my thoughtless hand has brushed away. Am not I a fly like thee, meaning a fly like you? Or art not thou meaning, or are you not a man like me? For I dance and drink and sing till some blind hand shall brush my wing. If thought is life and strength and breath and the want of thought is death, then am I a happy fly if I live or if I die? This is a really unique poem that contains layers of meaning. Remember that poetry is communicating meaning both directly and indirectly. It is a difficult genre of literature to analyze, which is why we're going to use a tool to help us do it. Well, let's take a look at this tool before we dig into the poem deeper. It is important to pay attention here as your independent practice will include you using this tool. This tool is called TPCAST. Notice that each of the sections begin with the respective letter in the acronym. We have title, paraphrase, connotation, attitude, tone, shifts, title, and theme. Let's create a fresh template on your notebook paper Sketch the seven sections going down your paper like the one I'm showing you. Don't worry about labeling it yet. I'm going to give you time to do that when I go over each section. It doesn't have to look fancy or anything. Just give yourself enough room to take some notes. Great. 
Now, let's talk about each section. Each of these sections should be completed in sequential order. Label your first section title. You may want to make a note that in this section, your goal is to consider the title of the poem and to make a prediction about what the poem is about. Poets are very intentional or purposeful about how they label their poems. There are always going to be important clues to the poem's meaning in the title, which is why it's a great place to start. For what reasons might the author have chosen the title The Fly? Take a moment to jot down your thoughts about the title of this poem. Perfect. So let's take a look at what I wrote now. I wrote the title, The Fly, helps us to focus on the importance of something we might not consider that often. Maybe he plans to say something about a fly that will surprise us. Again, there's no right answer here, so I'm sure what you put down is great. Let's look at the next section, paraphrase. Pay close attention as you will be paraphrasing the poem after we read it. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to read it again to you. So here, write down in your words what happens in the poem. You are trying to write down what the poem says literally on the surface, not in its layers of meaning. This is a really simple paraphrase. So listen as I read and make yourself some notes as we go. Little fly, thy summer's play, my thoughtless hand has rushed away. Am not I a fly like thee, meaning a fly like you? Or art not thou, meaning, or are you not a man like me? For I dance and drink and sing till some blind hand shall brush my wing. If thought is life and strength and breath and the want of thought is death, then am I a happy fly if I live or if I die? All right, take 30 seconds to finish up your notes in that section. Great. Let me read what I put now. A small fly was simply flying about, and I carelessly brushed it away, maybe killed it. I asked myself what the difference was between the fly and me. We do a lot of the same things, and humans die like flies do. If there isn't much difference, can I be happy if alive or dead? Hmm. Can you see that I kept my paraphrase casual and simple? I am simply trying to capture the literal idea. Let's try the next section, connotation. Remember that connotation means an idea or feeling that a word invokes in addition to its literal meaning. Here's what we start to dig a little bit deeper into the poem. We are looking for meaning beyond the literal. Poets use a lot of tools to do this, including figurative language or non-literal language, imagery, sound devices, word choice, some of the most Common figurative language devices are simile, metaphor, personification, and symbolism. Did you notice any of those present in this poem on the first or second read? Let me read through it again and think about those different elements and see if you notice any in the poem. When you do, jot them down on your paper. You're not trying to get all of them. Just think about the ones that are most important to understand the poem. All right, let me read it again. Little fly, thy summer's play, my thoughtless hand has brushed away. Am not I a fly like thee, meaning a fly like you? Or art not thou meaning, or are you not a man like me? For I dance and drink and sing till some blind hand shall brush my wing. If thought is life and strength and breath and the want of thought is death, then am I a happy fly if I live or if I die? Hmm. Take about 30 seconds to finish writing down your notes.
Here are some things that I noticed. First, I noticed that the author is telling the poem from the speaker's, which is a human's, point of view and not the fly's point of view. This helps the reader to remain in the mindset of a human reflecting on his or her relationship to the fly. I also notice the speaker's use of the word play in line two. All humans can relate to play and understand its importance. They can also make an easy connection to a fly's behavior being similar to play. It establishes the connection between human and fly right away. There are a number of other things, but I think you understand what is being asked for in this section. Okay. So we're going to stop there on the TP cast for today. I want you to hold on to that. So we'll get back to it tomorrow. So let's take a minute to reflect on today's lesson. Today we learned about William Blake's life and work and used a handy tool, TP cast, to analyze one of his poems. In the next lesson, we're going to finish working through the TP cast and then use it to analyze another one of his poems called A Poison Tree. For your independent work, please respond in writing to the following questions. What stood out to you the most regarding Blake's life and work? What personalities in society today are similar to Blake's? Are, there, are they positive or negative influences in why? What did you learn the most in our analysis of Blake's poem, The Fly? And what was the most important thing you learned so far in using TPCast? And then what are your thoughts about the poem? Is it silly or something important to consider? Explain your answer. I've enjoyed working with you on analyzing Blake's poem so far. Thank you for inviting me into your home. I look forward to seeing you in our next lesson in Tennessee's At Home Learning Series. See you tomorrow.